Taking into account the massive support and care I had from my parents as a child, I don't see myself as lucky. Many children around me, at least from the outside, seem to be brought up on a similar level. As a child, I believed that most everyone I knew grew up in some sort of warm or supportive environment, but that may have not been the case. Suffice to say, I was more than naive to believe this to be true. While I never bothered to pay attention to the family situations of my closest friends in grade school, I'm sure there were some serious issues. Oftentimes, parental guidance is only replicated by the children being instructed. Tough kids tend to have parents that lash out at them, class clowns reflect parents who can't control them, straight-A students that place an emphasis on grades are probably following a strict foundation. More troubling than these examples, however, are the smaller implications that lie within this idea. Instructions kids are meant to follow, rules enforced by adults, compliance with strict guidance that can easily be misinterpreted. Like how a child, forced to clean their room, heavily emphasizes tidiness, but only in that aspect of their life. Too many rules or instructions while reasoning for those instructions are not given. Minor issues brought about by teaching kids the right thing, but the wrong way. This leads to core values and priorities to either develop horribly wrong or not develop at all. To you, I'm sure it sounds like I'm rambling incoherently, and that's probably the case. But this may all come full circle after you read the books for yourself. Because these simple ideas can create a horrifying atmosphere in the comfort of a perfectly normal setting. And that's exactly what Nisio Eason does. Warning. By no means is this a thorough review. Not that I would mind reviewing this excellent piece of media, but I would rather discuss the piece itself without placing it on some sort of scale. Instead, I will choose to focus on the more perplexing aspects of the book without giving away too much. The contents of the story are a tad graphic and may turn a few people off, so viewer discretion is advised. Spoilers will be kept to an absolute minimum in order to encourage reading the manga yourself. Although this is not going to be spoiler filled, I can't help but let some minor things slip. So this is your warning, if you need one, to go read the incredibly short three manga volumes that are Nisio Eason's Imperfect Girl. For the 10th anniversary of an aspiring author, it seems only fitting to create a novel about an aspiring author. Back in 2011, Nisio Eason had his aforementioned 10th anniversary. Uh, hi, uh, future Nyanachi here. I made a mistake in this video, and uh, I, I'm very confused because um, I, I looked up, when I was making this video, I looked up when Imperfect Girl was released, and it was released for Nisio Eason's 10th anniversary. Um, and via Nisio Eason's um, fandom wiki, it says it was released on September 7th, 2011 for his 10th anniversary on his 10th anniversary. But Nisio Eason's 10th anniversary would be in 2012 because that's when he released the uh, first uh, Zaragoto book, which was the first book he published. Um, so that's a little bit confusing. My teachers told me to never use Wikipedia, but I think it's actually a pretty valid source. If anybody would want to um, uh, help me out on this uh, uh, endeavor, I, I, I need to know. I, I need to know. I'm, I'm very curious, uh, <laughs> and I'm very confused. Thank you. Um, back to the video. His 10th anniversary was celebrated with the creation of Imperfect Girl, a one-off light novel about a fourth grade girl kidnapping a college student. The novel version is Nisio Eason's original vision for the story of Imperfect Girl but unfortunately there's no English translation. But all hope is not lost. In 2016, mangaka Mitsuru Hattori gained approval from Nisio Eason to interpret the novel in his own vision via manga adaptation after reading the novel and enjoying it himself. Thankfully, this version did receive an official English translation, licensed and published by Vertical Comics. Although the manga is not the original work, it is still incredible in its own way. As with most adaptations of novels, some inner monologues and context are dropped in favor of the visuals doing most of the work. And the visuals are a perfect fit for the type of story that is Imperfect Girl. Hello manga enthusiasts, my name is Nyanachi, and this is Nisio Eason's Imperfect Girl. The preface to this story is the fact that our main protagonist and narrator, who isn't even given a name, does not describe this as a story. It is an incident, rather. Portrayed by an author, now out of college ten years in the future, from when the incident took place. 
At the time of the incident, the main character was only an aspiring author, creating what he calls lies versus actual tales. Although he claims this was the incident that made him become an author, he later states that he doesn't consider anything he's ever written a novel. As you can already tell, our main character is a self-insert of Nisio Eason himself, and while self-inserts can sometimes ruin a story, Nisio Eason does anything but that. While the main protagonist's career does play into the story a fair bit, it really only comes full circle at the end. After all, the narrator is only a catalyst for the true focus of the story, which is our secondary character, the incomprehensible fourth grade girl, given the alias Yu Yu by the narrator. Yu is discovered by the main character via an odd happenstance involving the beheading of her best friend Akami. The dark twist only pages into the first volume sees a truck take out Akami right in front of our main character's eyes. Rather than being isekai away from this cruel reality, Akami is actually dead, with her severed head now being cradled by her closest friend Yu. While this seems like the start to an average horror manga, there is one twist. Yu saved and turned off her video game she was playing before rushing to her best friend's side. Not a likely action for someone who just lost their closest friend. Something was off not only with the order of Yu's actions, but her entire composure. The seemingly average fourth grade girl had been noticed by our main character for what she truly was. His prying eyes did not sit well with Yu, leading her to take unpredictable action thus causing a spiral of what could only be called outlandish events within the span of a little over a week. In their next interaction, her recorder is used to crash our main character's bike and steal his keys. Yu then sneaks into his apartment to hold him at knife point with a box cutter and walk to her house across town. She then tosses him into her closet where he is held hostage for roughly a week. With an off-putting first interaction followed by a horribly sloppy kidnapping attempt, our college student and aspiring novelist is tipped off that something is leading you to take these actions. Rather than call the police, the main character is far too intrigued and decides to play along with her scheme, for what ends up being much more than just the questionable antics of a fourth grade girl. With the basic premise out of the way, and a setup for the main characters to grow off of, the events that transpire play out like that of a mystery novel. Yu's intentions are to force our main character to keep her identity a secret ever since he saw what she was truly like that day, and our main character is trying to piece things together while contemplating escape. From the very start, it is evident that Yu did not plan this out. Leaving a box cutter with him in the closet, as well as not taking his cell phone away, were many of her mistakes. There's also several of Yu's behaviors that don't add up, such as her wishing the main character a good morning despite her being the kidnapper, as well as her surprising willingness to bring him food when he finally asks, only to yell at him for eating without giving thanks. Then of course, there are the obvious questions involving Yu's parents and why they aren't present. However, as time passes for the main character, it becomes quickly evident that the parents are not going to be his saving grace. Much of the first volume is spent entirely in the closet, which may sound incredibly boring, but knowing Nisio Eason, there are enough inner monologues to keep the story rolling. These come not only from the current main character, but the narrator as well, ten years into the future. The idea of the narrator telling the tale from the future leads to a lot of well-executed foreshadowing. Instances like the main character linking being placed in a closet as a form of punishment in the moment, as well as narrating that it is also a method of abuse. Then, there's the stench in the house that the main character sums up to the idea that every house has its own stench, but you forget about it until it pops back up at the end in the worst manner possible. The narrator tends to emphasize how naive he was, and how he should have pieced things together better. Oddly enough, the main character sympathizes with you and feels as though the authorities could possibly make the situation worse for her. To him, the child is not a monster. She's just incredibly misunderstood. It isn't until he searches the house that he realizes he should have contacted authorities sooner. The house is even worse than what he had already witnessed. No food in the fridge, implying that what he was fed was Yu's only school lunch, a clean sink and bedroom while the living room and laundry pile up. Yu has some sort of obsession with formalities, while some responsibilities don't seem to matter. There is no order or structure the main character can see until he stumbles upon the source of her odd behavior and the jigsaw falls into place. The way the parents had raised you is quite interesting, to say the least. 
The way Nisio Eason writes Imperfect Girl keeps you on your toes. Even if some of the elements of surprise are a tad predictable, much like the main character, you don't tend to think about the obvious truth because it's darker than you'd like to believe. Then there's also the artwork, which is executed tremendously well. Mitsuru Hattori has a very well detailed and eerie style that makes each page worth more than just a glance. Imagery that adds suspense and style to the work creates an atmosphere that can't be achieved in the original novel. Not to mention the diverse facial expressions of the main character and lack thereof for you. The seemingly mundane scenarios that make up Yu's horrific personality are kept behind clever page turns and framed extremely well when they are on page. The closure for this story isn't perhaps happy, but more realistic than most of Nisio Eason's fantasy work. Like I discussed at the beginning, we are often ignorant of the way other children are brought up. Your family may be comfortable and happy while your neighbors is constantly fighting. The idea of the way a child was raised horribly backfiring isn't inherently terrifying. That is, until you realize how messed up a family structure can be. Because the situation depicted in Imperfect Girl could reasonably happen, it brings latent horror into the forefront of our minds. Something we don't often think about, but can hit way too close to home. For what was just a one-off anniversary celebratory novel, Imperfect Girl defies expectations. While it's not the best or most ambitious work of his, it is still very much worth a read.